Good afternoon, everybody. So thank you for joining me today. I'm trying to get my light in like Oprah. Um, at today, oh my gosh, I just saw, okay, yes. So today I just was washing dishes and did not realize that this had happened. So that's lovely. Uh, but today we're gonna be speaking with Heather Petrie. She and I have not met face to face um, in the beautiful world of Instagram and the beautiful gift that this pandemic has given us as we get to meet awesome people that we haven't shared real space with. Here she is. Okay. We're just gonna dive into community and get to know each other. Hey there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. So I just wanna tell, I was just tell, just teeing it up and telling people yeah. who you were. Um, thank you so much for sharing time and space with me. Uh, we have yet to meet in person, right? I know, <laughs> that's wild, but I love I know, it. we've only, how did we connect? Era sisters. Era sisters. God, I tell you what, that's the gift that keeps giving to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love it. I know. So, it's amazing. Heather, I just want to dive in. I want to t always set the tone and the intention of what I want this to be. I want this yeah. to be a time where you get to share who you are. And invariably, when you're sharing who you are, where you're from, how you see things, what got you where you are, other okay. people see themselves in it. And yeah. when we are more connected and verdant world, we interact with each other better. Yeah, yeah, right. When we're absolutely. more connected, we behave better. We behave more like mm -hmm. human beings. We see yeah. each other, we care. And when we're more fractured, we ignore and the world is not a better place because of it. So no. that's what I'm doing. Sorry, the doorbell <laughs> just went off. I love that. All good. You might hear dogs. I have a six uh, month old puppy and an eight year old dog and a 17 year old. So, you know, love who knows it. what could happen. <laughs> love it. So thanks for being here. Okay, so Heather, I'm just going to jump in. So tell me one, where are you? Where are you located? Minneapolis, Minnesota. Technically I'm in a suburb. I'm in Maple Grove, Minnesota, but I um, grew up in the Twin Cities and uh, grew up in South Minneapolis. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And how long, so you, you've grown up there your whole life? Uh, yeah, I've grown up here my whole life. I did live in uh, Maryland, in Gaithersburg, Maryland for a short period of time after college. And I lived in the Chicagoland area for a little bit. So I've experienced other parts of the country, but this is home and this is where I'm back to. Hey, that feels good. Yeah. So Heather, um, I, I start with a few questions, but they will eventually, your answers will start making me think about other questions. So yeah. tell me, tell us what it is that you do. Well, that's a really good question. I always laugh when people ask me that because I'm like, you know, what do I do? I do a lot of things, you know I, I mean? But don't, me. don't most of us as women, I feel that's like, right. we, you know, we wear all kinds of hats. So um you know the common thread that i've seen in everything i do from working at i've worked at a couple of fortune 50 companies mm -hmm. uh, and then currently i'm doing consulting um and just kind of doing my own thing but the common thread through all of that and what has constantly shown up in my work is being whether i was a um whether my position was to be an actual um, manager of people or leader of people one of the things that i found a common thread in is coaching and being in this space of listening and mm -hmm. um, hearing common human threads of challenge and um, seeing myself in other people, but also, you know, perhaps sometimes that you mentioned, you know, them seeing themselves and th some of the things that I've been through. And so by nature, just even in, you know, peer to peer or whether it was a direct report, having this place to show up kind of as a coach and being really authentic with just what my journey has been. Mm. Um, that tends to just be who I am by nature, mm -hmm. is to be a pretty open book. And so um, a lot of what I do, <laughs> yeah. you know, what I get paid for is consulting and marketing and storytelling, but, um, and, but also then doing some personal coaching and speaking pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm really, really passionate about is connecting people and their stories and really helping people see, because it took, I had my own journey um, getting there is, who oh, am yeah. I versus who did I think I was supposed to be? Ooh, ooh, you're gonna un you're gonna have to unpack that. <laughs> mm -mm, I like yeah. that one. So tell yeah. me, you just you gave me a beautiful leap into the next mm -hmm. question. Then tell me who you are and what is the difference between who you really are and where the place that you sit and where yeah. you admit where originally where you thought you should have been or who you thought you should be. Who um, did you so used to think you should be? 
Oh, I used to think I should be um, the, so I call myself a recovering perfectionist. Ooh, um, I love that. <laughs> and, you know, that I'm a recovering that. people pleaser. Oh, well, there's, that's part of it. Um, th there's a lot there too. So, you know, I think as it is when you're recovering um, and <laughs> you are not, uh, you, you don't have, have it mastered. Moments. Yeah, you, you do not have it mastered. It is a constant practice mm -hmm. and intention in trying to move through that, right? But mm -hmm. um, for me, it was really, uh, I felt like I was supposed to be, supposed to be everything that society um, either directly told me or showed me, whether, right, that's through, whether it was through media, whether it was through kind of those untold expectations or unset expectations, um, through what I thought friends and family wanted me to be, you know, um, I am no longer married, but when I was married, it was, <laughs> how do I show up and be the perfect Perfectly wife and partner? How, how am I supposed to be the best mom? What does that yeah. look like? Um, how am I supposed to be the best girlfriend, the best daughter? And, you know, when I say that, it's not, I think there are so many times that people in our lives, they're not intending to put that upon you, sure. but we all come to the table with our own stories and experiences and, things that we've been through and we might not even be aware we're putting those expectations on other people or that they feel we are. Sure. And um, so I think for so long, all I did was try to show up and, and it always rooted in um, wanting to be loved and accepted, but yes. which connects to that people pleasing. Yeah. Wanting to be enough and not too much mm -hmm. wanting to be good enough for exactly who you were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I did, you know, whatever I felt that was in the moment, um, I didn't have the, confidence in the life experiences yet to root me in like, but wait, who do you really want to be? So for me, it was, um, I was grew up as an only child during my childhood. And for me, um, I, I'm a natural born rule follower to an mm -hmm. extent. I'm um, a rule follower too. Yeah, you know, like there's certain rules where I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. But you know, like, right. if it if a door says in and out, right, I, will I go, go in the, the indoor, for sure. Me too. I will not go in the outdoor. Mm -mm. And I and it's not that I think it's bad. It's just a, no. it's just an acknowledgement of kind of how I'm wired. I'm like, oh, yeah. like my cousin would be like, I don't give a damn. Yeah, I'm going through whatever one of these doors, and I'm like, oh, and and when they say it, I'm like, you're you're right. We could do that, but in yeah. my natural, no. I'm going in that indoor. Like, no, hey. absolutely. So I think you know that feeds so much of how you show up. Then is sure. what is the, what are the rules around who I'm supposed to be. Ooh. And I better show up that way because if I don't, people aren't going to like me. And if they don't like me, they're not going to love me. And if they don't love me, I am not enough. Ugh. And, um, you know, I mean, what talk about a human condition that so many people go through. Um, and I, but I think, and I, I think it's, you know, it doesn't matter on gender, but yet I think so many women mm -hmm. um, really struggle with this aspect um, of life. And so it took a lot of life experiences. I'm just think, taking notes while I'm looking down. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, but I think, you know, after 40, people said, right, when you turn 40, like you start to not give a damn. Right. And I was like, oh, okay. And you know, a little it's bit of that. Ha yeah, I was like, okay, tell me more. Let me see. And you know, what was just speaking my language. I know. Mm -hmm. So I'll be uh, I'll be 48 in August. So I, I'm well into my, you know, like learning that. how to not give a damn. Right. <laughs> I'm 45, but I will be 46 this summer. Yeah, see, hey, so I think like for me, life experiences and things that I've gone through and many of them rooted in pain um, that pushed me into a space of, I don't wanna keep being the person I think people want me to be. Like, who am I? I don't want to be worried and this is a silly example but i've used this before um i don't want to be worried that i have the loudest laugh in the room anymore because that's being too big and bold oh girl mm -hmm. and i have a loud obnoxious Freak. cackle mm -hmm. like you know and then i'm like oh does it feel good when you do it heck yes it feels good and i'm like why do that. i care if i'm the loudest one in the room like so i'm full of joy oh that's too bad <laughs> right because debbie downer is not walking and going yeah. i hope i'm not gonna bring this whole room down they right? don't care I know, but I think because you know, they're so wrapped up in their own pain that keeps them locked in that space, right? Yeah, and I think you know, as as women, we are <clears throat> often taught that um, the smaller and quieter you are, the more lovable you'll be, the more liked you'll be, the more people you know will want to spend time mm -hmm. with you and invite you into their spaces. And I only I finally got to a place where I was like, yeah, but I'm not I'm not happy in those spaces. Mm -hmm. If I have to be really quiet and really um, 
just kind of and I and I grew up actually fairly shy like when I was younger I was pretty shy Who are you um, and yeah and people who know me now who didn't know me then are like what right <laughs> I said no really like I was kind of shy you know I was a little bit I was kind of just trying to mind my place yeah um, I, and that doesn't even work either you know I wish no. sometimes you can go back and tell your Alyssa because what you're trying to do is you're trying to um you're trying to negotiate pain and you're trying to, uh, you know, circumnavigate it, you're yeah. circumvent it, right? And the truth is, even if you get so quiet and so small, um, there will still be someone who will try to find that corner and tell you in that corner that you're not enough. Yeah, so absolutely. You, it's like, I always say, it's like, you, you, you can't, um, I, I told a friend of mine this last year, I was like, look, you, you can't avoid the asshole. No, no. You can't, they you can't. show up. You they can will. be really small, you can yeah. get really big, you can be who you are. So since I can't avoid the asshole. They're not invited to the party and they don't care. Thank you. <laughs> so 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 they're gonna they're gonna have their comments no matter what. And and when Absolutely. you consider the source, do they know you? Do they care about you? I'm always I've in the last mm -hmm. few days I've really been processing the voice of the critic. The mm -hmm. voice of the critic never does never wants to A help you. Nope. B care for you. So why would they tell, do I want to care and protect it? No. And I think, you know what, there's that aspect. And then I think there's the piece that's even, um, that's also so hard is that the people that are in your life that either they're family, so mm -hmm. you didn't yeah. choose them. You can't and I don't, get away from them. I yeah. And, I, and I, don't, I don't mean like, you know, if I have any family watching, they're probably like, oh, <laughs> I don't mean, you know, but I mean, you know, that there's this, um, you know, or you, you even look at past relationships and you think, okay, um, how you show up and how, what the expectation, whether they're putting it on you or you perceive it. Um, what I've learned through divorce and through um, another long-term relationship that had broken up was that I kept trying to show up in a way that they would love me and accept me more. And um, to unpack that a little bit further, I'm a, I'm a child of divorce. And I think that when your parents split up, no matter, and I have two beautiful and amazing parents who co-parented um, beautifully, but divorce is still divorce. And when you're a child and you're on the, that receiving end of it, even though you logically know at some point in your life that that was nothing, their divorce was nothing about you. Right. As a child, you still perceive like I wasn't good enough for them to stay together and love one another. Yeah, that's the perception. Um, and that until you really do the work on yourself, that stays with you. And I think it will always be with me. The difference is I've had enough therapy and self reflection to go, oh, Great. catch it when I'm. Therapy. Oh man, like mm -hmm. I it should be like. Um, you know, oh, like, yeah, it's a requirement. It <laughs> is. I don't know how hey, people do without I, it. Listen, I don't, it has carried me through so Absolutely. many, so many errors of my life. Absolutely. But I think, you know, when you, um, when you've been through a divorce and you feel like maybe, a, you know, when, when you perceive that it's because parents didn't choose you, which again, isn't the truth, but in a child brain, um, then you take that into relationships, right? And so for me, if I feel like, well, I didn't, live with my dad so like if my dad and my mom didn't stay together why would any other man want Ooh. to stay with me oh so you and, take it in that's because when you're that young you're unable i forget what the term is in psychology but you're unable to differentiate your parents from mm -hmm. yourself that's why on the yes. playground the biggest insult is your mama because when they're saying your mama, oh. they're saying that against you. You're not you. able to yes. separate you from who mm -hmm. your mother is. Absolutely. And it's, and, it's, and it's rightful, right? You're a kid. You don't have the framework. You don't have the language. No. Um, but that's, that's why I, we do need to talk to people about that. Because that oh. is something that is very intrinsic to who we are Absolutely. at that age. We're not able to do it. Absolutely. So, it, so the mother, your mother and father's divorce would be a pulling apart of yourself to you. Absolutely. And I, and, you know, I carried that unknowingly into my relationships. And mm -hmm. um, because I was on, a, you know, my own journey of learning self-confidence and finding my way, I, I really linked, and I think, you know, so many women do this too, is um, linking ourselves to, and our our worth as a being to the success of our relationships. Absolutely, that's that's a good one. And um, 
<laughs> you know, it's just not true. But on mm -hmm. the surface, it feels like it is. And so what I learned the really, really hard way is through my two um, failed long term relationships. Um, and I should add right now that um, in case he's watching that I'm in a wonderful one now and he's completely supportive and allows me to show up as who I am, all the good, the bad, the messy and the hot mess, right? Like, that's awesome. it's all good. Um, but I think that what I learned so that took me so long to learn through two really long term relationships over 20 years combined, mm -hmm. is that no matter how much I morph and change and bend and mold myself to be who I think they want me to be. Ooh. I'm still not going to make them happy because a I'm not myself. Mm -hmm. B, um, when they leave, which eventually happens, if you're not wholeheartedly <laughs> showing up as who you are, and you're pretending to be someone else sooner or later, the gig is up. It sure is. And when that happens, now you're left with who not even yourself because you haven't been being yourself, right? You like this imposter. Yeah. And, so and furthermore, I'd like to say C, you never held the power to make them happy in the first place. No. You were trying to it, absolutely your, your efforts were of futility, you know, absolutely. because they weren't like, man, I'm happier. Yeah. The only yeah. person who's worse off in that situation is you, mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And you know what I learned, of course, about that, too, was that not only did I not have the power to make them happy, but oh, by the way, they didn't have the power to make me happy either. They it's I do not believe that it's two halves make a whole. Right. Nope. Like, does somebody add joy to your life without question? If they're the right person, they add so much joy to your life. Ain't but that it's truth. only on you to find and seek and develop your own happiness. Because right. if you're not there, no, nope, it doesn't matter how much somebody gives you, how much they shows up, how much they show up. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still laying your head on your pillow. And in this being, you're in this you're, body. You're in your you're own in mind. mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think, that. you know, that's just um, those experiences are part of what really, really drove me to really look inside myself and say, okay, like who, who actually are you? Let's peel off all of these layers of masks. Was it scary masks. for you? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. First, yes, because I had been wearing masks for so long that mm -hmm. I really didn't know who I was or what I wanted. Like I knew, you know, I knew that I loved being a mom. I mean, you know, there were some very core things that I knew that I loved and brought joy to my life. But really if somebody said like, what are you passionate about? I really didn't know because I was spending so much time trying, time trying to be passionate for my family to, especially when I was in my second relationship, because since I'd had one failed one, right now the pressure's on the second one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I got to do something right. <laughs> I got to make and this show work. that I am not a failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what happened there, of course, is that I was so busy trying to not let that relationship fail that then that one hung on longer too, because I was so tied up in, if I fail at this, like who is gonna love me? Oh my God, who Let's is pause gonna right love there? Me? That is, that's a huge thing, and I and I don't think mm -hmm. that's nothing that's unique to you. Like just sit with that. So you felt. I just want to reiterate it. Yeah. That oh my God, I have got to make this work because if I don't make this work, then there's something intrinsically wrong with me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I failed on like an epic level. Yeah. And I will never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Like the, the coffin is nailed. I suck yeah. at relationships. I suck. Yep. If, like I don't, if I don't do this, I suck. Not only do I suck at relationships, but who's going to even want to like go on a date with me? Because I, and I carried, um, <clears throat> there was so little um, self-worth, I would say, that I held for years and years and years of my life. There were, you know, there would be pockets were of things. Were you aware that you, when you were there, I'm interested mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. sat in this space of such little uh, self-worth and value, were you aware that you were sitting there? Or was it only upon reflection and, and contemplation and looking back over your shoulder? I was not aware of it for most of that time. Like, what did I knew it feel like to you? Um, would it living in the space of not knowing your value and your worth, though you are unaware that that's what you're in, mm -hmm. what did that space feel like for you? You know, I think for, there was a couple of things. I was, I felt like I lived a lot of going through the motions mm. and I was kind of here and I thought I was down, I thought I was down here. Right, right, right. But I was really up here and hadn't really, really done the deep, like, let's take off the, all of the armor and really dig into that work. That's right. Um, 
I did, I was not aware of it for a long, long time. Um, one transformative piece for me that helped me figure out I was there was reading Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Mm. And I don't know if you've read that one. I haven't read it yet, but I know I need to. It is, um, it profoundly impacted and changed my life. And, and when I read it, she was doing, um, a, she did it, a class with Oprah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. And I did that. And there were exercises in the book that made you, like one of them was take a selfie. And this was like early days of selfie. This is right. before the lights and the, right. you know, the, <laughs> this is like. When they're ten, desperate looking things. Yes, right. And it, but, it, but the lesson is it's still not so the powerful. Kim Kardashian selfie. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> um, with a team of people actually behind the selfie camera, right? Yeah, and the no. wind is blowing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. got the Beyonce fan and the. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can I? Can you please up that fan a little bit over there? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Make my hair blow a little bit more, <laughs> yes. please. Yes. Um, but the the um, the one of the things, the lessons I learned was in the, one of the chapters was take a picture, a selfie, and and hold, write down I am enough and hold it up in your picture, and take one one selfie. Not a thousand. Not a thousand. Add the filter. Pick the best angle. <laughs> Not, no, one of selfie, that. Right. one selfie, right? Holding uh -huh. up a piece of paper saying yeah. I'm enough and post I'm it. Enough. Did you do that? I did. Do you know how hard it was? Oh girl, I know. It was so, and th again, this is before even selfies were as big as they are now, girl, before yeah. the gazillion filters, before yeah. lighting. And that was one of the most powerful lessons, right? And then there was another lesson in that book that has also profoundly changed me, which was go back and find a picture of yourself as a young child, when you were not aware of your body but, or concerned, and I'm paraphrasing here, but, but what I remember of the lesson was basically pick it, pick a picture of yourself as a kid. When you like, when that's, who do you want to be again? Like, where's that picture of you as a kid where you're like, I want to be her again. Oh. And I found a picture of me. There's a couple of pictures of me when I was young and I was hands on my hips right? Just like super sassy looking and Bass like- Bass frass, I could tell. Yeah, like I am happy and I'm cute and look at yes, my red gingham dress. Yes. And um, well, it, I sobbed when I found my picture because that was the moment I realized how far away because the world, the world had gotten to me. In the picture, I was young enough to not have a clue yet about all that was gonna come raining down on me all the masks I felt like I was going to have to put on mm. uh, to feel like I needed to show up yes. and when I found that picture and have, so, have since found a couple pictures like that where my hands are on my hips and uh, you you just see the twinkle in my eye and this light and it was gone that light was gone and had been gone for so long and I realized in that moment how far away I had gotten in all of these years from that little girl who had so much hope, felt so alive, so much energy, so much spark, so much like, isn't life great? Like, and, lo and loved myself, you know? And why moment. do you think she did? Why do you think that little girl was so apt to love herself and, and just j enjoy being in her mm -hmm. person, enjoy being in her mind, enjoy being in her twirly dress and patent leather shoes? Why do you think that little girl was so happy? Because she didn't, she didn't know any differently yet that you couldn't, that it was even, it was even an option to be unhappy with yourself. You might be unhappy that your mom made you eat vegetables, but you weren't unhappy about yourself. Right. right? You might be unhappy that you couldn't have Oreos, like a whole sleeve of them for dessert, but you didn't know that you couldn't. I love what you said. She did not even know it was an option not to love her. That it hadn't even dawned on her that there no. would be anybody who had an opinion that no. she was not amazing. No. Isn't that amazing? And so to me, what that's speaking to is she, her mind and how she perceived life hadn't been sullied by other people's opinions of her. Exactly. The only opinion she knew was she was great and you were great. And she hadn't felt pain yet. Yes, mm, that's true. That's right. You know? So then there's that, then you add like yeah. real life, you know, like, and pain is necessary and pain is necessary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
the place I'm in in my life now is like, I don't like pain. I don't, nobody enjoys feeling pain, but I've done so much work on myself that I know there's so much power in pain. When you learn how, and I don't mean power as in, um, you know, going after the people that are bringing you pain. I mean, power as in self realization and actualization and growth. And you take that pain and you say, okay, this freaking sucks. Mm -hmm. But what can I do with it? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think I I don't personally believe in the phrase that everything happens for a reason. Uh Because I've been through some things in your life in my life that I go, I don't know that there was a reason for that. Now, I do believe I can pull something from that. Absolutely. And find meaning and growth and purpose in that pain. Absolutely. I mean, that's what Viktor Frankl, I always reference him in all of almost like probably like so many of my interviews, because he's a huge part of my thought process on Mm -hmm. this. And this is what you're, you're positing exactly what he says, you know, like, so in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he, he, he posits that man needs three things to have meaning and purpose in their lives and and a sense of also love, of course. Yeah. And that is man needs something to get up to do, you know, something that they have to put their hands to something you Mm -hmm. have there, you have to do tomorrow. Man. Second man needs to exist in community. Man needs to love unconditionally and be loved unconditionally. Mm -hmm. The third thing is, and this is to your point, maybe not everything is for a reason, but there certainly is a way to extrapolate meaning and value. The third thing he said, man has to be able to look and perceive at his difficulties through a redemptive lens. You have to. Mm, Otherwise, yeah. you will just feel like a rock being tossed to and fro. And Victor Frankl yeah. came up with that ideology in a concentration camp. So if he can do that in the crucible right. of life, yeah. we too can do that, right? We too Absolutely. can find the value. It's not to go, oh, there's great meaning, and or or that was even enjoyable. But it is to know, hey, let me tell you something. You have mm-hmm. you have something in front of you that you could pick up some of the greatest things. You know that Victor yep. Frankl kept. Um, so we know he was a neuroscientist, uh, you know, and phys- doctor, and he saw that there were a lot of people in the concentration camps who were suicidal, as I think I would be. You know, mm-hmm. like what, I, I see it never ending. It's extremely yep. painful. These people mm-hmm. are not giving me any kind of love or respect. Mm-hmm. But why am I here? Right? And this is how he kept his fellow prisoners from killing themselves. He said, if you kill yourself, you'll be forgotten. And it'll mean mm-hmm. nothing. But if we let them kill us, we will show the world how evil they are. So he, mm-hmm. fe- he let them find the redemption and the value and even their own murders. This is yeah. incredible to me. This is incredible to me. So this, this puts me in a position like what you're talking about, like, okay, so I have some difficult crap happening. Mm-hmm. There is something to be able to pull from that, right? Victor Frankl yeah, yeah. died before I was born. And I am reaping the benefits of his mm-hmm. life. So can't, what other wonderful things mm-hmm. can be reaped from your, your, your difficulty, your hardship, your heartache, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that, again, referencing therapy um, okay. and all my years is that my therapist talked to me about, you know, in one of the many painful stuff that I had been going through, she said, you know, you, you have to learn how to sit through the pain. You have to learn to do that because she said, you know, here's the thing you like, it's not, you think by ignoring it, it's going to go away Mm -hmm. and it doesn't. And, you know, I add my own spin to that of like, listen, if you don't sit through the pain and you don't process it and you don't work on moving through it, I mean, there's no shortcut. There's no easy way out. There's no, I'll take this path over here and I'll get to avoid it because here's the thing, avoiding it only lasts so long. And then that Part of my swearing, that shit comes out sideways. A oh, one thousand percent. You're gonna meet it down the road. You're gonna yeah. meet it again down the road. <laughs> you're it's gonna, gonna be dressed different. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> and not only are you gonna meet it down the road, but you're gonna probably also um put that pain on other people unknowingly, right? Well that's what we do. That's, that's what, what we, we do. do. That's what pain does. Right? You know, I mean hurting you hurting people hurt people. 
Absolutely. And so um, that was one of the most valuable lessons I've learned. And although I don't enjoy it, I really have learned to give myself grace and be really aware of when, ooh, like I am, you know, what am I doing to try to avoid the pain right now? And of course, right, there's all the ways that we know people traditionally do that, like whether it's drinking or alcohol, um, mm -hmm. sex, busyness, mm -hmm. um, working harder, right? Absorbing themselves maybe in their children's life beyond maybe healthy meat. Like there's so many things that we do to try to avoid feeling what we have to feel. Yeah, but again, it, it doesn't go away. And you can't grow and move on as a person. And it, you know, it doesn't mean that the, the you know, I, I feel like the big things that I've gone through in my life that have been really painful, I've moved my way through them. It doesn't mean I don't ever feel pain about them again. Sure. Right. But you go like, okay, but it's as with anything like time mm -hmm. does. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I believe time heals wounds, mm -hmm. but I do believe that time provides us the ability to um, process it. Maybe it's even get used to the wound a little bit. Ooh, ooh, right? I like that. Get used to the wound. I, because yeah. I think you can have these wounds and they don't have to be terrible things. Because I think that that's part of the rich, richness of our life too. I mean, I think about it, if I didn't go through the things that I've been through, I wouldn't be able to do some of the things I love, for example, coaching people. I wouldn't be able to show up in a way that's vulnerable mm -hmm. and sharing my own stories or be able to have wisdom from, I don't perceive to be any kind of expert, mm -hmm. but I can say, you know what? I've been through a divorce. I know what it's like to not really know who you are. And I think, you know, um, a big piece of the people that I tend to coach or, or when I'm writing, people that te tend to identify the most with that, what I write are women who are typically mothers. They're typically 30 something or older and they have completely lost mm -hmm. their independence or individuality in who they are because, yeah. because they put so much into their family right. and beautifully so, right? Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden their kids start to get old enough where they don't need them as much. And suddenly they're like, what am I doing? I don't even oh, know God. who I am. I can't, I don't know what I want. I don't know how to make a decision. Mm -hmm. I don't know when my last kid leaves the house, what am I going to do? I don't even know what I'm passionate about. Right. And some of these women aren't, these aren't also aren't women who have been staying home with their kids solely. Some are, but some are women who have actually really great careers outside the home, but have just kind of been an autopilot there too. And they, it's not that they don't like what they do, but you know, I think we all get that point in our life. And never pause to think, what is it that they really wanted to do yeah. or, or more importantly, I like to say is, that, what were you brought to this earth to bring? Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't know what that is. They don't know what that is. And I yeah. think, you know, Are you here? I think it's, it's <laughs> such a powerful thing. Um, and I think so many people are searching for that. And typically it's, it's right within them. But I think sometimes we think when we're searching for like, what was I put on this earth to do? Yeah. We sometimes, um, put a lens on it that it has to be this really big thing that the world would know us for right and that's not you're my, the very thing i might be brought to do is things like this right that impact one person today who has been at home because they can't go anywhere and they're with their family and they love them dearly but they're like i don't even know the skin i'm in anymore mm -hmm. i don't know who i am all I've been doing is serving everyone else. And I don't, that's, I'm not happy with that. Yeah. Like I love my family and I want, but I want that to be one piece of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said, you know, many people think about when they're, it, it's such a daunting thing, I think for people to process because mm -hmm. they think it means they need to come up with something really big that's yeah. monumental. And mm -hmm. right now, because we're so, so in the social media world, it needs to bring fame, you oh, know, yeah. you need to be right. famous. Yep. And, and that, that's not the case. It's, it's correct. Like we are, we are mm -hmm. brought here for something special. Absolutely. Every one of us. I don't know what it is, but I do know that the thing that gives me great meaning and purpose in my life is to be about the business of figuring that out. Yeah. 
and, and yeah. to do it in my everyday little things. Like I, my, my heart's desire is that I leave people better. Mm -hmm. I leave people lifted. I make mm -hmm. them think and feel something that's transformative and makes them feel more connected to the larger, you know, the larger context of humanity. Yeah. And that can never be a bad thing. So I no. feel that. So the yeah. other day, an example, and that's what I was about to ask you, give me a story. So the other day, I felt like I was supposed to write a commencement speech for the class of 2020. So I sat down and wrote it. Nobody asked me. Yeah. No, not one person was like, mm -hmm. hey, can you? So I sat down and wrote it didn't think it and performed it, spoke it, put it out there into the ether of life. Mm -hmm. Didn't think much about it. Just was like, whew, I, I, it was just something that yeah. kept beating on my heart. So it's done. It's out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So the other morning I, I wake up and I have quite a few DMs. And this one DM is from this lady. And she says, hey, you know, you don't know me but I just wanna thank you so much for writing this speech. She said, my 17 year old daughter is graduating. She's so overwrought with anxiety mm -hmm. and pain mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And this Sunday morning, she has watched it three times. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to know there's a 17 year old girl in South of Dublin, Ireland, who has watched you three times and you are giving her food for her soul. Oh my God. So maybe that talk, yeah, was only meant for her. Who knows? Right. But I wrote it. <laughs> and you, you know, what's so beautiful, though, is not only did you write it, but you felt the pull and you followed it. Oh, my God, I had to. It was and keeping me up. <laughs> so many, and I'm speaking about women, because that's what I know. But so yes. many women, including myself, until the last probably five years, don't follow mm -hmm. those gut feelings, because they think everything from they just don't put themselves first to be able to do that right. to not feeling that what they have to say or share is worth it or worthy or they're enough or because they aren't insta fame, whatever. Right. right. Um, but even if it's not something that was put out there publicly, I think just we stay small going back to all those years where we felt stay quiet, unseen, don't be loud, you know, just keep your place, mind your business. That's right. Back. honor that pull like there's so much beauty and and there's just so much that comes from that not only for yourself because it fills you and also by the way then triggers again more um you know you listening to that calling that you had fills you that mm -hmm. gives you more right you know you're like okay you know and you have did you have done something that really was you couldn't ignore that calling and then now that was a gift for a girl, 17 year old girl in Ireland, right? And whoever else knows, but you know about that one. I know about her. And and she and she and mm -hmm. that blessed my heart. And I was like, wow, absolutely. If I wrote that poem, that also shows me in the larger context, how special all of us are. Even absolutely. if it was only for her, this thing that was beating so heavy on my heart in Charlotte, North Carolina, was for you mm -hmm. was for you, young mm -hmm. lady. All of, mm -hmm. uh, I, I had an answer yeah. to your angst on the other side of the globe and it's coming to you. Isn't that yeah. a beautiful thing? It it's also shows me how special we are in the larger kind of zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. We Absolutely. are amazingly special creatures, each Absolutely. one of us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you a question because you spoke to this and, and I know it's, these are phrases that a lot of us are hearing now. So sitting with the pain, mm -hmm. what does sitting with the pain look like for you, Heather? What does that look like? So for me, um, it's a couple of things. It's intentionally being, making time for stillness. And when I say that, that may, that may mean meditation, or it might mean not filling my day with a whole bunch of mindless things to avoid mm. hurt. And so it might be, for me, it might be writing, because writing is something I'm super passionate about. Um, and have been for uh, ever since I wrote poems about boys that didn't like me in sixth grade or whatever. I love yeah. That. Oh gosh. You know, I wish I would have kept them. Um, but at some point in my early twenties, I came across them and they were so painful that I threw them all away. Oh. I know. But um, I think for me, writing is a big piece because that is a, that's my own therapy. In addition to going to see a therapist, mm -hmm. writing is therapy for me. Um, and it really helps me 
provide some organization to this like chaos Mm -hmm. of thought that you have when you're, especially when you're in pain, Mm -hmm. but also um, because I write and often share, I don't share everything I write, but when I do share what I write, what I've found similar to your poll to do this commencement speech is that almost every time I write something that's like a really heartfelt something and whether it's on a blog or it's a micro blog on Instagram or on Facebook, at yeah. least one person reaches out to me and says, you always know you like your words always find me mm-hmm. when I need them. It's like, you knew what was going on in my mind. And that's and, the specialness of that poll. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because you know, and, and, for somebody else that might not be writing, but it might be, you know, paying for somebody's coffee for you, mm-hmm. you know, behind you in the co- the drive through line, right? Like it doesn't have to be about writing. That's not the, even the message I'm trying to share. But the thing is, is that for me, when there is pain, I know that the proper way for me to heal and grow and move through that is to allow myself to really feel it. And if I have been bottled up and not allowing myself to be physically emotional by crying, maybe that is turning on like the four songs that make me cry no matter what, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like there's yes. certain songs. We right? all have like, those songs. We do. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like for me, one of those songs is piece by piece by Kelly Clarkson. Her. Oh my God. I know the that slow girl. version song. Okay. And don't make me just go back and find it when she sang it on American Idol because I will boohoo in the first three seconds. You, you mm-hmm. know what? Right? Mm-hmm. That song. Ugly I, just cry. Got, I just got like goosebumps because um, that that song brings back pain from my own parents' divorce. Right? Now it's not like one like it's not the same situation that she's singing about her own father, but it brings back the pain of what that was. Right? So sometimes my point is I need a little trigger because sometimes we are really good because we have to be, you know, especially if if we're moms and we're having to show up on, um, you know, calls for work, like I don't have time for tears right now. So you like put on those, you know, I'm fine. And sometimes you do that long enough and it's hard to get those tears flowing. So I put on one of those songs to just get the actual physical release of crying. Yeah. the other I love thing that, that I... you're saying that sometimes you just need a prompt because you've been sitting in kind of like the shutdown world for so yeah. long, but you're mm-hmm. still feeling all the things. You're you still feeling it. You just haven't exercised the access, the expression mm-hmm. of it in a while. And you know what I think? Um, I think more and more people are realizing right now, especially being in the state of the world that we're in right now, yeah. that there's a lot of things that sit below the surface that we don't even realize are there because we're so busy wearing our armor and showing up to not be affected because um, we can't, you know, we don't feel we can because we're too busy again, trying to mother, take care of a household, teach our kids from school, from home for Pete's sake, you know, work. I mean, there's only so much you can do at once. Right. And it's hard right. to do all of those things while sobbing. I mean, I've done that, but it's hard. And you certainly can't sustain it. And so I think what, I, what I'm realizing in talking to people too, is that, and maybe you have had some of these conversations too, but what I've realized is that, especially during this level of quarantine, there's a lot of days where I think I'm okay. Yeah. I think, I think I'm okay. Yeah. And then I, I stub my toe Oh my Mother gosh. Scratcher, you. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but then I'm like, this whole day is screwed. Right. I'm over it. I, this is the dumbest day ever. I can't, you know, and I realize, like, oh my goodness, how dumbest much was day. right below the surface right. that has been, you know, just waiting for something to. Can explode. I tell you a story of mine where yes. I know that exact feeling? So. I have stuff going on in my world too, like we all do. And. Yep. And some of it is, you know, pretty heavy. A lot of people who watch me know. So my husband had a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. It's not going that great right now. And we just got stuff, right? And and, um, I I go running in the mornings. Yeah. And you know, this which bless you because I have tried to like running and I cannot like running. I've tried. That's all right. That's all right. (laughs) I just adore it. I don't like, I will love that. I'll be so in my head Mm -hmm. and I'll be like, Oh, two miles, you know? Um, and, and, and so I need it, It, but Mm -hmm. here's my little, 
like where I realized, oh my God, I'm feeling a lot of pain underneath mm -hmm. and I'm feeling anger and frustrations is, so with this whole COVID, you know, when mm -hmm. you're running down the road and someone is running to you, we're all supposed to part yeah. Yeah. to make sure we're six feet apart. And this is very vulnerable that I'm about to share with you. And I live in a largely white community. I, and when I really realized it, I, I, I've never encountered a person of color when I'm running. And every time I'm on my, we're on the track or on the trail, on the sidewalk, and it's time to park, there's always an expectation that I part, that I get in the road. Mm. And they never do. And I, I finally, was, I was like, the other day, this guy, and I, but I have a husband that I have to really con be concerned about his immunity. Yeah. So I can't right. play chicken with you. I can't play chicken and be like, who's going to move? Yeah. But I remember feeling a sense of anger yeah. bubbling. If I was like, if I have to move off this damn sidewalk and get in the middle of the road one more effing time. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what are, and I did and that's when I knew I was like okay now it, it is legit they need to be getting off the road too but I yeah I real yep. I was able to feel a level of anger and mad yeah. like I was angry yeah and it was more than just them not moving off the sidewalk mm -hmm. it's the stuff that's going on in my life so I love Absolutely. that you pointed that mm -hmm. well and I just think you know we we do what we need to do to survive and cope you know that's right and, and some days we just don't have time to process the pain. No, you don't. You know? And so I'm not, you know, that's an important thing to note too. Like real life is you can't possibly feel all the pain all the time, every moment of the day, Ooh, consciously. You can't. you can't. You can't. And you can't mm -hmm. sustain if you do, um, if you try. <laughs> and so I think- You'll you go know, crazy. To, yeah. And so, you know, like, listen, right? If I'm, if I'm here, which I am every day <laughs> right now, if I'm here in my home and I'm, trying to do work and making sure my son is getting the last of his, it's his senior year too, and getting the last of his schoolwork done and, you know, dealing with the dogs having to go out and, you know, running a household because I'm a single parent. I can't be sitting in the moment feeling the pain all the time because bills got to get paid, right? That's right. They so, do. People have to like, eat. Yeah. You know, I'm, <laughs> when I'm calling my the creditor, they're not like, oh, you're sad today. You can pay tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> like, that's that's all right. But like, you know what? Let's just give you an extra eight months. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's not really how it works. So, you know, I think like there's a time and a place, but I think what I've learned is to really, really practice the art of having the intention behind, I am feeling something. I need to find time. And maybe it's not right at this moment, but I need to find time to sit in that pain. And so whether it's writing, whether it's turning on a couple of those songs and just crying for me, my version of running is lifting weights. If it's going, now Ooh. I can't go to a gym and do it right now, but me to do that. One, of, one of the things that has, um, that was another turning point for me where I actually found a lot of worth was learning how to power lift and competing in power lifting competitions. Ooh, because that's so sassy. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, because the, the story behind that is um, that I was telling myself, but also some of society tells you less these days than it used to is a woman doesn't lift weights. A woman could get too bulky. You don't want to look bulky. I mean, BS, whatever. If I want to look bulky also, why do you care? Right. Anybody who says that, right. You know, but I, it took me a while to get to this place where I was like, you know what, if somebody they says- they want you to comply with their narrative and they their do. story and what they're they do. Mm -hmm. And I had people that were in my circle, um, they weren't my closest friends, but I had people in my circle that when I announced I was starting to, um, you know, I shouldn't say announce, that makes it sound like it was this, you know, I had no, no but when you started that, sharing but, it. Yeah. <laughs> but when I started sharing that I was yeah. really digging lifting weights, um, this was like six, seven years ago, and I was gonna compete in, in a competition, um, I had a couple of females in my life that said, Oh, you're not going to get bulky, are you? Or oh, you're not going to look like one of those he, she's, are you? And I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, yeah, but it taught yeah, me a lesson. Just, yeah. What was, what was that lesson that it taught you? The lesson it taught me was number one was, um, why do we, including myself, because we are all guilty. 
yeah. right? Of judgment. And no matter how yeah. hard we try not to judge, we have our biases, we have our judgments. Um, I think when you have gone through enough therapy and become really self-reflective, um, you then notice when it happens and you're like, oh, check myself, right? Yeah. And you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it sometimes, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, so I'm not claiming any perfection in this space. Um, but it, it taught me both what my own judgments were that I might be having that I didn't realize I was having. Um, and the, the bigger lesson it taught me was, okay, so why would I feel, or in this case, why did this person feel compelled to judge and tell me what they thought I should or shouldn't, or who they thought I should or shouldn't be? Because yeah. if it doesn't impact them in their life, why, why do they matter? care? Why does it matter? Like, you know why? I, because it's easier to care about things that don't require work from you. Absolutely. That's why. Right? It's easier to care about your hair than to care about my heart. Yeah. Absolutely. Or to say something about your hair than to, to sit with that pain and be like, what's going on? Why do I want to kick that guy who won't yeah. move off the... I mean, I straight up was like, I'm going to kick you in the head, like in the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and I was like, oh my God. Oh, oh. Lord, like, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> well, well, and we'll test the army. Right. Right. What I... What I both, what I, the other thing I learned was, um, uh, that's my dear friend who just said, you're speaking to my heart. Um, oh, <laughs> <Carrie. Thank you. laughs> um, but one of the things too, that, so it's interesting is when the person said that to me and I got really pissed off, right? Uh -huh. I was like, Oh, and I have been lifting weight. So you're going to say that, you know, <laughs> you, heard, you don't know about these guns I got. That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> what I learned was like, okay, also like, let it just wash off, right? Like just right. Because I was pissed. Mm -hmm. I was pissed, but I was like, okay, but also they're speaking that from wherever they're at in their space. Uh -huh. And what it brought to my attention also was in this land of social media, especially is if somebody shared a picture. Um, so I got really, really lean. I got really buff. I got really lean Ooh. and I was in great shape. And I was like over 40 and I was, proud of my body because I had worked. I might be DMing you after this, so go on. <laughs> and I had worked hard. Now, what I will say is in the last year, I've put some of that weight back on. And now you added two months of not being able to go to the gym. And you know, there's just, I'm doing what I can at home, but it's You don't want to see my jeans. You do not oh. want to see them. They're hanging on to God's unchanging Listen, hand. Listen, I, I put on jeans once in these last um, nine That's weeks wonderful. and it was last week and they still fit, but <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I can be in your video. I can be in your video, Vixen video at the end because that's I'm what's like, happening about, here. They're painted oh, on. I have a can of biscuits that's going to pop itself <laughs> open here soon. I better be oh careful. So, but I, but what I learned was that um, even, you know, I was proud of the work I'd done in my body, but still I'd be on social media and see somebody that had something else visually that I thought was better than what I had or, had or who I was. Yeah. And e even though I'd done all this work on myself and was in a really good, I mean, we're, st we're human, we're still going to have insecurities, mm -hmm. right? But here, have you ever done this, right? You're on social media and like real life moment, right? I don't know anybody hasn't. Um, but you look at somebody's picture or video and you're like, <sighs> like your response is like this visceral, like, be because what, when, what are you saying? Express it so I can fully understand. What is the response? So like, um, for me, what I realized was if I saw somebody who I felt had, um, like I was lean, but you couldn't see like a six pack on me. Right. right. But I was, le I was lean. I mean, it, yeah, but I had not, I had, not, but I was still eating enough calories that, you know, you didn't see ripple, 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 ripple. Right. right, right? right. And if I saw somebody, a woman who had that, I got angry. Because I did, a little jealousy? Yes, envy and yeah. jealousy. Now, I didn't yeah. know right in the what moment. What it was. It my was visceral amazing. reaction was like, why are you sharing that? <laughs> you didn't even want her to share it. Yeah, I know. I no, want to see it. that. I get it. Yes. Now, if I no, have it, no, I want to share it. it, but I don't want to see yours. <laughs> right. No, I get it. Because yours like, is making me feel worse about mine. And why would that happen? Oh, because I haven't sat in the value of mine. That's why. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, but that was something I learned through somebody making a comment and judging about how I looked. Uh -huh. Why did it matter to them? Right. And then what I realized was, oh, but like you've done that before. Why it matters is because wherever I'm at about myself in the moment, I'm projecting that. Right. Again, back to the hurt people, hurt people. Now, I don't mean right. that it's the four agreements. Take nothing yeah. personal. 
And you know, yeah. that person- How people are has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. Guess what? Your opinion of me is none of my business. None. It's just not. None. none. And it doesn't matter. And, it, and your opinion of me is not reflective of who I actually am. Your Absolutely. opinion of me is actually reflective of who you are and where Absolutely. you sit. Yep. You and know, you know that's a hard lesson. Okay. It's, it's hard to own that, right? I mean, it's hard yeah, as a person to go. Because you don't look pretty Ooh. in it. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not the filter I want. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm, I'm Mother Teresa. And right now, Obviously. I'm looking like Dr. Dre on the Chronic <laughs> album. Right? You know? Like, I get it. I know. Yeah. But it was a good lesson. I have a question for you. Me. Yeah. Sorry. Ooh. I want you to finish your comment. I oh, just I know say, we're down. It was important because it helped reflect on me. I learned both, you know, I learned that not only do I not take, need to take to heart what other people say, because uh, their opinion of me is yeah. none of my business, but also it was a good mirror for me to go, ooh, when are you doing that? Heather, when are you doing that? Be aware. That is mm -hmm. Be aware. Just because you so think it doesn't mean you're stupid. True. Or, or <laughs> also what you've also pushed us towards is probe yourself as to why you're thinking and feeling it. Probe Absolutely. yourself as to why you're thinking and feeling it. Yeah. No matter what it is, just probe, like yeah. why? And, and, if, and if the answer to that why is not sitting you in good, sound real estate, then you need to work on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. If it's not, if, it does, if the answer doesn't, because I'm sitting in a tremendous place of value and self-worth mm -hmm. and love, then you need to work on that. And the only thing that would allow you to feel that is when you're not sitting in that space, right? Absolutely. And there's no finish and line, like, by the way. <laughs> Right. And, and the finish line is when we go, when we die, yep. we go to the other side. So Absolutely. I have a couple questions because we're yeah. going to end in four minutes here. <laughs> it will cut me okay. off. Um, <laughs> so I really love James Lipton. And I really love the show Inside the Actors Studio. I mm -hmm. know those people who've heard of it. It was like the lar it was like the largest low budget show ever. So we always end it with these several questions. And I just want to yeah, ask some of you. What, <clears throat> okay. what sound or noise do you love? Ocean. Mm, me the too. ocean. Never gets old. What sound or noise do you hate? Mm. You know what I think? I've, because of quarantine, I've noticed is um, the sound of traffic. Because I don't have it right now. And there's, I can hear my neighbor's kid practicing their clarinet in the middle of the day. You would have never been able to hear that before quarantine. And I think there's such beauty in that. Yeah, so we don't like trap. I like that. What's your favorite word, Heather? Ooh, um, my favorite word, I'm cheating. I'm gonna give you a phrase because I have a tattooed on my body and it's called, it's graceful warrior. Graceful warrior. Mm-hmm, I have it tattooed on my Why arm. Why is that your favorite word? Um, so it's, I would say, um, there's the tattoo. I like it. It's pretty. Um, Who's script? Is that yours? Yeah, it's no, it's not mine. But um, graceful and grace would probably be one of my favorite words. And, and that's part of why I put it in here is because um, I've needed to learn how to, to not only give other people grace, but I'm pretty actually, I'm pretty good at giving other people grace. I have been pretty terrible at giving it to myself. To give it to self. So okay, mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Last question. If heaven exists, what do you want God to say when you get there? Mm, that's a great question. You've always been loved. <laughs> that might make me cry. <laughs> that one's gonna make me cry. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You've always been loved. Always been loved. Heather, this has been a tremendous time for me and it's been tremendously valuable and Thank you for taking me in and allowing us to see your internal world and your process. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My heart is full. Thank you. What a way to start a Monday. Yes. You have a beautiful day, Heather. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye. <laughs>